Stillness Flowing, The Life and Teachings of Ajahn Chah by Ajahn Jayasaro, narrated by Gosaka. Chapter 11 Ice in the Sun Luang Po's Waning Years Even gorgeous royal chariots wear out, and indeed this body too wears out. But the dumber of the wise does not decay. Thus indeed say the wise amongst themselves. Dhammapada verse 151 Part 1 Body Sick, Mind Well one day, as the illness that would go on to render him bedridden for the last years of his life was starting to take their toll, Luang Po Cha spoke to some lay supporters. It's like you've got a horse, a wild, fiery horse that's difficult to train. When it tries to run off, keep hold of the reins, don't lose your grip on them. But if the horse is really galloping away full pelt, let the reins go. If you don't, then the next thing you know, your hand will be torn off. Let the horse and the reins go their way. Don't let yourself be hurt by it, let it go. But if the horse is just straining on the rope a bit, then try to restrain it, master it. This is the way to relate to everything. Our body is like a horse. If it gets ill, then we look after it with medicine. If it's going flat out on its way, and we can't hold on to it, then we let it go. We don't interfere with it, we let it go its way. That's all there is to the body. It's born, and then it goes its way. And then there's no caring for it any more. The body has run out of options. Let it reach its natural end. Everybody wants to live a long time. But the body is unable to do that. When it reaches its time and its place, then we have to let it go. Don't make it suffer, just be the one who knows. Know that what is ours and what is not ours are mixed together. Wherever there is to be found what is conventionally referred to as ours, we find what is in fact not ours. Understand it like that. Then it won't matter if you're sitting or lying down in a hospital full of pain. If your view is correct, then you'll be at ease, at ease precisely where the pain is, at ease where the feeling manifests. The mind sees what is peaceful in the midst of turmoil. Luang Po's understanding of pain and illness had matured after a lifetime that had seen its fair share of both. In his middle years, his physical endurance had been legendary, but by the age of sixty, Luang Po looked like an old man. In his uncompromising efforts to realize the Dhamma, his mind had reaped the rewards, while his body had paid the price. Although he had suffered from the mild asthma that ran in his family, Luang Po had been a healthy boy. His first encounters with serious ill health occurred when he left the life of the village monk and set off into the forest. Details of Luang Po's health through his Tudong years are sketchy. It's known that he contracted the usual fevers, including malaria, that afflict almost all forest monks at one time or another, and in 1951 he suffered an extremely painful stomach condition. But the main source of discomfort during this period was his teeth. In 1953 he endured a period of intense toothache and swelling of the gums. A visit to the dentist does not seem to have been an option. Years later, he revealed his favorite method of dealing with a rotten tooth. He would tie one end of a length of string to a small rock and the other end around the tooth. Then he would throw the rock with all his might out into the forest. In 1967, the problem with his teeth got worse. His gums became so swollen that he was unable to eat for a number of days. Perhaps for the first time in his life, he went to see a local dentist. Against the dentist's advice, Luang Po insisted that all 16 of his remaining teeth be extracted in one session. 
While Lung Po did not opt for transcending dental medication, the impact of so many extractions on his nervous system rendered the injection he received almost useless. To deal with the pain, he put his mind into a state of calm. It felt, he said, as if the sensations from every screaming nerve converged into one place. Then that gathered pain started to contract until it almost disappeared, his mind observing the process with detachment. Nonetheless, after the dentist had finished, blood started to flow and did not stop until three days later. In 1981, as his health followed the downward spiral that would result in paralysis, he spoke of his tooth extraction to a group of visiting villagers. By the age of 50 or 60, your teeth start to come loose. Oh, you want to cry. You're eating and you feel like tears are going to fall. It's like you've been elbowed or kneed in the mouth. The teeth ache so much. It's suffering, pain, torment. I've been through this myself. I had all my teeth pulled out. These in my mouth now, all false, every one of them. There were 16 left, and I had them all pulled out at one go. I had had enough of them. The dentist was scared to do it. I said, go ahead, I'll take the consequences. And so he did, extracted all 16. About five of them were still firm, but I had them out anyway. As a boy, while I was grazing the cows and water buffaloes, I'd take ashes from the fire and polish my teeth to make them white. When I got back home, I'd shoot myself a smile in the mirror just to see the whiteness. In love with my own bones, I was an idiot. I loved those teeth so much, I thought they were such good things. In the end, they had to go, and the pain almost killed me. It was always easy to pick up some ailment or other on Tudong. During one walk on which Lung Po was accompanied by his old lay disciple Da Sui, he contracted an eye infection. Da Sui remembered that Luang Po saw his ailment as an opportunity to teach his companion a few home truths. Luang Po's eyes became very painful. I couldn't bear it. I tried to find some medicine for him, but he wouldn't use it. I didn't know what else to do, and I started to cry. He said, An old man almost on your deathbed and you're still crying. Laugh. It's only my eyes that hurt. You have to laugh as if it didn't hurt. You have to fight with death until you go beyond it. Two days later, he must have remembered a remedy. He told me to find some guisa leaves, squeeze out the juice and apply it to his eyes. He said to me, This is gamma. I know what the cause is. This is the result of gamma I've created. When I was a boy, if I saw a gecko, I couldn't leave it alone. I'd have to pierce its eyes where they bulge right out, and then chop it up with onions and grill it on the fire. Really delicious, too. Now that's all caught up with me. Whoever creates good gamma gets good results. Whoever creates bad gamma gets bad results. That's how it is. People's actions always catch up with them. Don't think that once you've done something, that's the end of it. Whoever cheats somebody will end up being required to give back what they've taken. In 1969, at the age of 51, Lung Po suffered from a heart complaint that was treated by his physician, Dr. Utai. Some years later, in the mid-1970s, his body began the rapid decline that, within a few years, transformed it. The lean, vigorous figure familiar to his early disciples, morphing into the portly and prematurely aged figure by which he is now most widely remembered. He said that he was not surprised at this development, considering the reckless way that he had treated his body in his younger days. He was more surprised that it had lasted as well as it had. It was in England in 1977, during his first journey overseas, 
that the initial symptoms of the illness that would paralyze him and bring an early end to his teaching career first appeared. On his return to Thailand, the episodes of dizziness and unsteadiness that had affected him abroad got worse. Some of the classic symptoms of diabetes began to manifest. The bottoms of his feet felt numb. He said he felt like he was walking on a mattress, and as a result, he began to use a walking stick. Although there were concerns that another long trip abroad would have detrimental effects on his health, in 1979 Lung Po agreed to visit his disciples in England, and from there flew on to America. He arrived in Seattle exhausted and spent the first few days resting. Chinese medicine and Korean ginseng, however, had a galvanizing effect. Before long, his attendants were finding it difficult to keep up with him, and he returned to Thailand showing no obvious ill effects of his journey. Back in Ubon once more, Lung Po announced that he would spend the rains retreat at the monastery in Ban Ko, where he had been a novice so many years before. It was a gesture of gratitude for all that he had received there. With Lung Po in residence, donations flooded in, and he was able to oversee the construction of a new Dhamma hall and kutis. It was the first time in 25 years that Luang Po had not spent the rains retreat period at Wat Ba Pong, but by residing such a short distance away, he gave his deputy at Jan Liam the opportunity to lead the Sangha during the retreat, while remaining close enough to offer counsel if the need arose. It seems that he was already addressing the need to introduce the Sangha to a time when he would no longer be there for them. After the retreat, Luang Po returned to Wat Ba Pong, where his condition slowly deteriorated. He felt a constant intense ache at the base of his neck. Massage gave next to no relief. Having always possessed an excellent power of recall, he now started to forget monks' names. He joked that his memory had decided to retire. There was no public announcement, as when civil servants retired from their posts, he said, there's just a whispering in your ear. I'm done. Periods of dizziness and unsteadiness came and went, arose and passed away. Late at night, Luang Po started to suffer from bouts of nausea, sometimes accompanied by vomiting. He lost his appetite and much of his strength. For a short period, a gift of high-quality Korean ginseng from a visiting Zen monk had a remarkable effect. During a meeting called to deal with certain accusations against a young novice, he spoke for seven hours. Some nights he would feel a sudden surge of energy and set off on walks around the monastery. But it could not last. Soon all the symptoms of his illness reappeared. Worrying Signs In August 1980, Luang Po went for a checkup in Bangkok. The diagnosis by his disciples, Drs. Sutep and Prapa Wong Pan, was that Luang Po was suffering from the following conditions. 1. High blood sugar, diabetes mellitus. 2. Cerebral insufficiency, an impairment of blood supply to the frontal lobes of the brain, with evidence of past stroke. 3. Periodic episodes of insufficient blood supply to the heart muscle, coronary ischemia. 4. Chronic, long-standing damage to the bronchi of the lungs, leading to the inability to clear mucus and secretions, often with a chronic cough and shortness of breath, bronchiectasis. And 5. Degeneration of the spinal bones of the neck, cervical spondylosis. Luang Po was prescribed various medications and he returned to the monastery where he insisted on maintaining his tiring schedule. The attendant monks tried in vain to restrict the time that Luang Po spent receiving guests, but he would not agree to them turning away people who had travelled many hours to see him. Teaching energised him. On one occasion, a young Englishwoman came to ask him a number of questions and it was almost as if he were back to his old self. Afterwards, he said that it was as if each of her questions sharpened the knife of his wisdom. After his guests had left, however, he would be visibly drained. As news of his ill health spread, 
more and more people arrived at the monastery with offerings of herbal remedies, nearly always accompanying their gifts with stirring personal testimonies of their potency. Lung Po tried many of them, sometimes merely in order to celebrate the faith of the donor. Although he formed no great hopes for these treatments, it was true that during the hot season of 1981, his condition did ease a little. But then it got worse again. By July of that year, the dizziness, unsteadiness and neck pain were intensifying. At a formal meeting of the Sangha, Lung Po stunned the community with the announcement that he would spend the forthcoming rains retreat period at Tamsang Pet, his branch monastery some hundred kilometers to the north of Ubon. After 25 consecutive retreats at Wat Bapong, it was the second time in three years that he had chosen to spend the retreat elsewhere. The reasons he gave when asked were that the air on the hilltop would be good for his health and that it would provide him with some respite from visitors. Tamsang Pet was also a place close to his heart and perhaps he wished to spend more time there while he could. But although Lung Po spoke of Tamsang Pet as a hilltop retreat far away from the crowds, it was in fact less than two hours' drive from Ubon on a good metal road. Inevitably, as the retreat period progressed, news of Lung Po's whereabouts spread. The crowds were not deterred by the distance. On the contrary, the journey made for a nice day out. The custom by which the abbots of branch monasteries took their lay supporters to pay respects to Luang Por and listen to the Dhamma during the retreat continued as usual. Luang Por also maintained his custom of visiting branch monasteries during the rains retreat. This year he seemed particularly determined to make sure his senior disciples understood his position regarding certain matters of the Vinaya. Despite his ill health, Luang Po continued to give teachings during the three months that he resided at Tamsang Pet. They include some of the most profound and well-loved of his recorded talks. His illness had not yet interfered with the simple clarity of his teaching style, and he drew upon the objects around him to act as similes and metaphors for points of Dhamma in his old inimitable, exhilarating way. A tame monkey, offered as a gift and often screeching within earshot at inopportune moments, provided fertile grounds for rifts on the restless monkey mind. And it was here that he gave one of his most famous similes, illustrating how the mind that has been brought to tranquility in the correct way does not stagnate, but bears within itself the impetus to wisdom, to seeing things in their true light. It's like still flowing water. On one occasion, someone asked him if he was so ill, why did he look so radiant? He drew an analogy with a car. You couldn't tell what was under the hood by looking at the chassis. When later asked a similar question, he replied that most sick people suffered, not so much from the illness itself, as from their desire to get better and the fear that they would not. As for him, he was unconcerned whether he got better or not. He was prepared for both outcomes and so didn't get worried or depressed. On another occasion, when a lay guest inquired after his health, he replied simply, These days, I don't take much of an interest in it. A sense of the atmosphere at Tamsang Pet on a weekend is well conveyed in Mayor Som Jai's account of her visit. Luang Po walked very slowly across the rocky area between the Dhamma Hall and the kitchen on arms round. As soon as he had appeared, everyone converged on him to put food in his bowl. Those who hadn't brought any food with them, or were too late to prepare it in time for arms round, squatted on the ground, hands in Anjali, expressing regret at missing the opportunity at least they would get the chance to offer their food in the Dhamma Hall at the mealtime. After Luang Po had taken his meal, everyone waited for him to come out and talk with all the visitors in the Dhamma Hall. A huge number of people had arrived already, and there was a steady stream coming and going throughout the day. In the evening, it was a bit better. Most of the people who'd come during the day had gone home. 
I listened to Lung Po give teachings from early evening onwards. He didn't sit on the Dhamma seat, but on his usual seat on the monk's platform. He taught in a relaxed, informal way, and every now and again with one or other of his guests. I remember at one point he talked about making mindfulness continual, and to show us what he meant, he lifted his kettle and poured out the water, at first in drops and then in a steady stream. It was one of the similes that he was fond of using in his talks. When it was time for him to rest, his attendant monk invited him to return to his guti. We all just held our breath, fearing that he would leave us. It seemed like he had only just started talking. Lung Po smiled at the monk, but didn't get up, and after a few moments continued to teach for a while longer. The attendant politely repeated to Luang Po that he should rest now, and we all groaned aloud. It was like a plea and a protest all in one. Luang Po smiled again and said to the attendant monk, I'll give them just a bit more. And he carried on until finally it really must have been time. Now when the monk invited him, he spoke in quite a firm voice and picked up Luang Po's walking stick. He stood there with his flashlight in his hand to show that he was ready to take Luang Po back to his guti. The attendant turned to all of us and said, It's already far past the time. Luang Po smiled once more, comforting us like a father, and said, They won't give me any more time. I suppose I'll have to go. It was as if the whole Dhamma Hall sighed with dismay. The time had flown by. It seemed that we had only been listening to him for a few minutes. I'd heard a Dhamma talk from Luang Po's own mouth for the first time, and I was utterly satisfied, but I still wanted to hear more. The monk with the torch in this recollection was Ajahn Pabakaro, an American monk who was now Luang Po's chief attendant. A veteran of the Vietnam War, he was six feet three inches tall, fluent in Thai and Isan. With his deep devotion to Luang Po and his attention to detail, he fulfilled a difficult task with great competence. Included in the job was the thankless task of playing the stern policeman. At one point during this rains retreat period, the chairman of the Royal Privy Council and one of Luang Po's old disciples, Professor Sanya Tamasak, came to pay his respects. Speaking about his illness, Luang Po said that he was ready to relinquish his body and not to worry about him. Professor Sanya fervently requested him to remain in the world some time longer for the sake of suffering sentient beings. Twice he made his request without response. But after the third request, Luang Po grunted his assent. Lump of Ice One day, while teaching a group of visitors, Lung Po said, This rains retreat, I don't have much energy. I don't feel well. My health is not so good, so I've slipped away to spend the retreat period here on this hilltop to enjoy the pure air. When my disciples and lay supporters have come to visit me, I haven't been fully able to repay their faith because I have hardly any voice left. My strength to speak has almost gone. Actually, it's a good thing that there's still someone sitting here for you to see at all. In the future, there won't be. My breath will stop and my voice will be gone in accordance with the causes and conditions governing the body. The Lord Buddha called it Kayawayang, the ending, the degeneration of conditioned things. How does this degeneration take place? It's like a block of ice. It starts as water and then it gets frozen. Before long, the block of ice starts to degenerate. Put a big block of ice out in the sun and you can see it happen. That's like the degeneration of this body 
it occurs little by little. Before too many minutes, before too many hours have passed, the ice will be gone, all melted into water. This is called kaya vayang, the ending, the degeneration of conditioned things. It's been this way as long as there's been a world. We are born carrying sickness, old age and death within us. This was a constant theme over the next year or so. Later, many people remembered him telling them that in the future he would no longer be able to speak. By the beginning of October, Luang Po's condition was causing deep concern. In the alternating pattern of good days and bad days that had been playing itself out over the past months, the ratio of good to bad was in steady decline. His scheduled appointment with the medical team at Samrong Hospital in Bangkok was moved forward and on his arrival there he was given a CAT scan, newly available in Thailand. The scan revealed an accumulation of fluid trapped in Luang Por's skull. The doctors recommended a surgical procedure in which a cerebral shunt would be implanted inside the skull in order to drain the fluid down through a catheter into his stomach. When the doctors first explained their proposal to Luang Po, he was not impressed. He nodded towards some fruit newly offered on a nearby table and joked with one of his attendants, the only thing that's getting cut up here is that watermelon. But when he asked if it was possible to cure the condition without an operation, the doctors were blunt. They said that implanting the shunt could not be a complete cure. Too much brain tissue had already been damaged beyond repair but it was the only way they could see to retard further degeneration. Without the procedure, Luang Po could expect his condition to steadily worsen. The opinion of other leading specialists was solicited. They were unanimous in agreeing with the prognosis. After consideration, Luang Po decided to go ahead with the operation. Why not, he said. Everything's a risk. Crossing the road's a risk. He hoped that it would at least enable him to do some more good for the sasana before he died. It had been agreed at Wat Bapong some time before this that the Sangha should be consulted before any major decisions were made concerning Luang Por's health care. For the first time, Luang Por ignored the protocol. A number of his senior disciples were already uneasy about the influence that they perceived and much overestimated. Ajahn Pabakaro and the Bangkok medical team were now exerting upon Luang Po. An operation on the head of the teacher, with all the transgressions of cultural taboos that entailed, would have created dissension with little prospect of a consensus emerging. Luang Po decided that he would present his disciples with a fait accompli. After all, he said, and not unreasonably, it was his head and no one else's. The operation took place on the 13th of October 1981. On regaining consciousness after the operation, Luang Po refused pain relief. He said this was the first time he'd ever had an operation and he wanted to see what the pain would be like. In fact, he had planned on resisting the effects of the anesthesia before the operation, but in his own words, it had snuck up and clobbered him. Disappointing results. A few kilometers away from Samrong Hospital, in the eastern suburbs of Bangkok, stood the house of one of Luang Por's lay supporters, Kun Ke Sri Bunsuk. Kun Ke Sri had recently had a two-story kuti built in the grounds of her family home for Luang Por to make use of on his trips to Bangkok. It was here that Luang Por and his attendants went to stay in the first period of his convalescence. While he was residing there, one of the strange things that often occurred in his presence took place. A lavender bush in the garden had stopped flowering seven years earlier after the death of Kun Kesri's son. Now, on Luang Por's arrival, the bush suddenly came back to life. It flowered rapidly, constantly extending its tendrils in every direction. Before long, the tree was covered in clusters of flowers right up to its peak. At first, the results of the operation were encouraging, 
but by the beginning of December, the old symptoms had begun to reappear. Luang Po was unsteady on his feet, sensitive to disturbance and weak enough at one point to be put on a saline drip. By the end of the year, however, there was a hope that this recurrence of symptoms had been a temporary blip. Luang Po's voice became louder, and he could walk some way without a walking stick. He ate more and rested better. He spoke to lay people and gave New Year's blessings. In the mornings, despite odd dizzy spells, he would try to go on arms round. In January 1982, Luang Po took up an invitation from a lay disciple, Dr. Gert Chai, to convalesce in his secluded seaside cottage, an hour's drive west of Bangkok. The fresh sea air seemed to induce a mood of optimism. Luang Po felt stronger, and the diabetes was under control. He was looking forward to returning to Wat Ba Pong, and it seemed that that might be possible before too long. The attendants were pleased to know that a new kuti was being built for him there, in the middle of an artificial pond, and accessible only by a small footbridge. It was hoped that this would enable the flow of visitors to be governed more effectively. In the meantime, Luang Po relaxed. He enjoyed listening to Dhamma talks on his cassette player. He was taken out for drives to nearby monasteries and stupas. Sometimes he would ask an attendant to read from the Thai translation of the Zen master Huang Po that he was so fond of. This bright period proved to be a mere interlude. By the beginning of March, Luang Po was suffering from frequent dizzy spells and nausea. He said his legs felt like jelly. He couldn't sleep and had no appetite. He started to talk about his death more often. Although he still had some good days, it was clear that overall his condition was getting steadily worse. Luang Po would eat no more than four or five mouthfuls of food a day. His sensitivity to sound increased, as did periods of cloudy vision. He became easily disorientated. On the 14th of June, three days before his 65th birthday, Luang Po returned to Ubon. Wat Ba Pong, June to August 1982 On the 17th of June, a large number of monks, nuns and lay people packed tightly into the Wat Ba Pong Dhamma Hall, ready to celebrate Luang Po's return to the monastery and commemorate his birthday. He had been away for almost a year, and there was excitement in the air. Everyone was eager to see him again, keen to pay their respects, and looking forward to hear him teach. Many of those who had been critical of the operation hoped that with Luang Po back where he belonged and out of the clutches of the Bangkok doctors, he would soon recover his health. Only a few were aware of the true seriousness of his condition. At last, the vehicle carrying Luang Po rolled up in front of the Dhamma Hall and he was helped out of it. Ranged in front of him outside of the hall, lay people sat many rows deep on either side of a cleared path. Women lay down their white shawls for him to walk upon. Luang Po moved with obvious difficulty into the hall, a senior disciple on either side of him, the towering Ajahn Pabakaro behind. All bowed reverently as he passed. Many of those who took a discreet glance at Luang Po were visibly dismayed. It was clear that there would be no rousing Dhamma talk. After the traditional asking for forgiveness ritual had been completed, Luang Po spoke into the microphone with a weak echo of his normal voice. In a few laboured sentences, he delegated his responsibilities as abbot and preceptor, and he emphasised the need for harmony and dedication to the practice of Dhamma. Even these few words exhausted him. And so... Without expressing his happiness at returning to his home, and without providing a glimpse of the warmth and humour and wisdom his audience loved him for, he brought the final public address of his life to an end. From this point onwards, Luang Po's physical decline gathered pace. He experienced intense headaches. The sound of the opening and closing of doors was irritating to him. 
the light of a torch beam or a camera flash painful to his eyes. His sense of balance became seriously compromised. He could barely lift his left arm and leg and began to spend much of the time in a wheelchair. Longpaw's body clock went awry. He would suddenly decide that he'd like to go out for a tour in the wheelchair during the hottest part of the day, or wake up asking for things in the middle of the night. Perhaps most distressing were the mood swings. He became stubborn and resistant, whereas formerly he had been the model of patience and self-control. He spoke much less and wore a strained, brooding expression on his face. When he did speak, his voice was almost inaudible. Sometimes he would mutter to himself and chuckle. Other times he wept. In a more lucid interval, he said to one of his attendants with his old lightness of manner, If I start laughing, don't join in. There's nothing funny. It's just my brain condition. I can't control it. Just let me be crazy by myself. You don't have to be crazy like me. One monk said, We understood what he was saying, but we couldn't help ourselves. When he laughed, we laughed. When he cried, we found we had tears in our eyes. It was difficult for the monks to see their teacher so reduced. A few privately admitted that if he had been afflicted by a purely physical disease, it would have been easier for them to bear. At least the long poor they loved and revered would not be dissolving in front of their eyes. Some became prey to doubt. Could this all be happening to a truly enlightened being? The more reflective monks realized that what was being thrust upon them in the most deeply unsettling form imaginable was the truth of anatta. It's relatively easy to accept the idea of the body as not-self, even by those who do not meditate. The changes that take place in the body throughout the day and over weeks, months and years culminating in death offer persuasive proof of natural processes which lack any controlling agent. Lung Po would often say, If the body's really yours, can you tell it not to get old? However, the teaching that personality is also not self is profoundly counterintuitive. The belief in a unique individual entity, the person, revealed most essentially in personality, is a bedrock of human psychology and culture. Only the most skilled of meditators can penetrate the unexamined false assumptions on which it is based. The monks around Luang Po were familiar with the teaching of Anatta and had varying levels of insight into it. But for most of them, what was happening to him now was uniquely stressful. Doctors from Bangkok flew up to examine Luang Po, suspecting a brain tumour. They advised another CAT scan in Bangkok, and the monks were informed that the Queen had offered to finance all future medical treatment. The Sangha, which had now taken over all decision-making in the matter, convened a meeting. It was reported that Luang Po had recently sighed, Enough of doctors. I'm done. But the difficulty of refusing the kind offer from the royal family coupled with the hope that Luang Po might perhaps still recover, swayed the Sangha in favour of accepting the offer. On the night of the 7th of August, the pain in the left side of his head had become so intense that Luang Po was unable to rest at all. On the 9th of August, he was taken on the Thai Airways flight to Bangkok, where he was admitted to Chulalongkorn Hospital. Ajananik was one of the monks who accompanied him on the flight. Luang Po said that he had agreed to go to the hospital again to make his disciples happy. It wouldn't be right for him to be a cause of concern to so many people. But he wasn't going to get better. The illness was the result of old gamma. Luang Po repeated that for him, everything had come to an end. In his heart, there was nothing left. It's up to my disciples what they want to do to look after this body. As for me, it makes no difference. 
Jula Longkorn Hospital, August 1982 to January 1983. The conditions awaiting the monks in the hospital could not have been better. Lung Po was given a VIP suite that included a room in which he could receive guests and a bedroom for his attendants. A team of six of the best neurologists in the country was on hand and they conducted every possible test that the technology of the time would allow. They concluded from the tests that there was no tumour, merely an unusually rapid onset of the next stage of the illnesses with which he'd already been diagnosed. Diabetes, cerebral atrophy secondary to arteriosclerosis, and multiple cerebral infarction. The condition of Luang Poor's brain, the senior neurologist pronounced, was like that of a man of 90. He was prescribed a cocktail of drugs for his brain condition, insulin together with a special diet for his diabetes, and daily physiotherapy. Luang Poor's hands shook. He was quiet and withdrawn, sometimes picking things up and then putting them down again and again. The drugs helped a little, his appetite improved, and so did his blood sugar levels. But new, worrying symptoms developed. If asked a question, his intended yes would emerge as a no and vice versa. Once, when asked if he needed to urinate, he said no, and then as soon as the receptacle was removed, began to urinate. For a brief second or two, it was funny. Every day the attendant monks would lift Luang Por into his wheelchair, and take him for a ride to a shady part of the hospital grounds. On one occasion, a woman catching sight of Luang Po dropped to her knees to bow to him, urging her young son to do the same. The boy ignored his mother. Remaining rooted to the spot, he stared with an unblinking gaze at the old monk in the wheelchair. With a great effort of will, Luang Po bent his body forward and extended his right arm very slowly towards the boy in a gesture of blessing and loving-kindness. The boy moved forward in response, and, hands in Anjali, inclined his forehead onto Luang Po's open hand. Such touching moments were becoming more and more rare. In October, Luang Po started to refuse to take the food that he was being spoon-fed, clamping his jaws tightly shut and flailing his arms. Nobody could be sure whether he genuinely did not want to eat or if this behaviour was just another symptom of his illness. The attendants coaxed and cajoled and implored him to eat. For everyone involved, these were awful days. At the beginning of December, Ajahn Liam told Luang Po that his speech no longer made sense and invited him to keep silent if he so wished. Luang Po seemed to be listening attentively. He never spoke again. Two days after the invitation from Ajahn Liam to stop speaking, Luang Po had a stroke. Violent convulsions shook all the strength out of the left side of his body. He was left looking like the shipwreck of a man not long for death. The monks were determined that if Luang Po was soon to end his days, it should be in the monastery rather than a hospital. The doctors were reluctant to discharge their patient. But when the Queen was informed of his condition and Lung Po's long-stated wish to spend the last days of his life at Wat Bapong, she settled the matter. An Air Force plane was arranged to take him back to Ubon. Ajahn Liam recounts that when he informed Lung Po, he opened his eyes and looked about, which, at that time, was his way of showing that he was pleased. Wat Ba Pung, The Silent Years Ajahn Liam was not convinced that this was necessarily the end. Luang Po was still only 64 years old. He believed that most of Luang Po's vital organs were functioning normally, and there was no reason why, if looked after well, he might not live on for years rather than months or days. Longer than some of us, he joked, with another of the senior monks. And he was right. On his return to Wat Ba Pong, Luang Po was invited to reside in a new, custom-built dwelling, constructed on an open piece of land at the northern end of the monastery. The nursing Guddi, as it came to be known, 
was a brick-built bungalow in the modern Western style. It contained two main rooms, one set up like an intensive care unit in a private hospital, the other left unfurnished for use by the attendants. Brick walls projected at right angles from the midpoint of the kuti at either side, separating the private from the public domain. Doors in the walls allowed the attendants to admit visitors at agreed times when the curtains of Lung Po's room would be drawn. Every day, people would come to catch a glimpse of Lung Po lying in bed and to bow to him beneath the window. In the evenings, weather permitting, attendants would wheel Lung Po outside. Guests would gather on the lawn at the back of the kuti to pay their respects. The nursing kuti soon became a place of pilgrimage for people from every corner of the country. Once a week, the Sangha Wat Banana Chat would come to chant a selection of the Pali verses that Lung Po had been most fond of. Chief amongst these was the Vipassana Bhumi chant that lists the basis for insight. A nursing schedule was established, comprising 15-day blocks following the monastic lunar calendar, divided into 30 12-hour shifts. A steady stream of monks arrived from branch monasteries to volunteer their services. Each shift was manned by four monks and one novice, with the night shift supplemented by a male nurse provided by Ubon General Hospital. A local doctor, who was a disciple of Lung Po, conducted a daily examination. It was agreed that there should never be less than two monks in the room with Lung Po at any time, day or night. By the time Lung Po had returned to Wat Bapong, his two chief attendants, Ajahn Pabakaro and Ajahn Bunlert, had absorbed a great deal of knowledge about geriatric nursing. They began to pass on what they'd learnt to the new volunteers. Both monks were intimidating, albeit in different ways. The American Ajahn Pabakaro for his sheer physical presence and the ease with which he could shift into his old military office persona when circumstances demanded it. Ajahn Bunla, a Thai of Chinese ancestry, for his unusually direct manner and unwillingness to suffer fools gladly. For this particular job, they were perfectly suited. Each nursing shift was selected to include a mixture of the experienced and the untried. Monks learnt how to lift and turn Lung Po, how to carry him to the toilet, how to make beds, how to take important measurements and make records. They learnt about nutrition, physiotherapy and more. Although the monks were new to all this, they were highly motivated. Nursing Lung Po was considered by them a great honour, and the Vinaya discipline had already accustomed them to the adoption of extremely precise and detailed procedures for relating to the physical world. Infection was the greatest danger, particularly through the respiratory tract. The swabbing and sterilizing routines acquired an almost religious tone. After some years, when doctors recommended using a nasal feeding tube, the attendant monks experimented with it on each other before using it on Lung Po. Although Lung Po was silent and largely unresponsive, he was treated with the same respect as he had always been. The attendants adhered strictly to the customary forms of address, preventing any lapse into carelessness or overly familiar behaviour. They bowed to him when entering or leaving the room. Before touching his body for any reason, they raised their hands in Anjali and asked his permission. They spoke in low voices in his presence and only on necessary matters. Often, in a corner of the room, an attendant monk with free time would sit quietly in meditation. In the early years, Lung Po occasionally showed some interest in the external world, not least on the 26th of February 1983, when the Queen was the guest of honour at the Uposata Hall consecration ceremony. While visiting Lung Po at the nursing kuti, the attendants noticed Lung Po making an immense effort to maintain his sitting posture and remain alert. On her return to Bangkok, the Queen arranged for Luang Po to receive regular treatment from a particularly gifted masseur in her employ. Initially, the massages produced some small improvements, but these were nullified by further seizures and were discontinued after three years. 
In late 1984, the most violent seizures so far required Lung Po to spend some days in the ICU room reserved for him in Ubon General Hospital, where he was also treated for pneumonia. The next major crisis came in March 1987. Lung Po, suffering from severe breathing difficulties, was rushed to Ubon Hospital, where it became clear that without drastic intervention, he would not survive. The doctors advised a tracheotomy. It was the first serious test of how far the Sangha elders were prepared to go to prolong Luang Po's life. Most monks had long been opposed to doing anything they believed to be unnatural treatments. Invasive procedures had always been considered the step too far. An emergency meeting, chaired by the governor of Ubon, was attended by senior monks and doctors. The doctors put their case passionately. They reassured the monks that the process was quick, safe and reversible. Most importantly, there was no alternative. Logic was on their side, and the monks were badly torn. Whatever their views on natural death, the sight of Luang Po fighting for every breath and choking on his phlegm was difficult for them to endure. A tipping point was reached when they were informed that the Queen had entreated them to give permission. The operation was performed that day. Less than a week later, Luang Po had recovered sufficiently to return to Wat Pong. In the period following the tracheotomy, Luang Po showed a new resistance to being fed. A troubled Ajahn Liam formally requested his forgiveness if they had made the wrong decision and begged him to take nourishment. Luang Po acquiesced. For the following five years, the story of Luang Po's condition was one of inexorable decline. Periods of relative stability were brutally truncated by crises, each one of which, having been weathered, left his body functioning on a slightly reduced level. He was hospitalized on a number of further occasions with pneumonia. A sense of the atmosphere in the nursing kuti during this period was given by Ajahn Anando, an American monk who at that time was the abbot of Jittaviveka Forest Monastery in England. In late 1988, he returned to Thailand to visit his old monastery and to offer his services to his teacher. I like the early morning very much, because you can spend time alone with Luang Po. From 2 a.m. until maybe 5 a.m., is the period when he seems to sleep most peacefully. Then a rather busy time follows. Depending on what day of the week it is, we might clean part of the room very quietly and prepare things for waking him at 5.30 to bathe and exercise him. Then, the weather and his strength permitting, we put him in the chair, the one that was sent from England with the money offered by people in the West. It's a really superlative chair. It does everything except put itself away at night. There's a sense of great respect and affectionate caring that goes into the nursing. Although he's been bedridden for almost six years, he has no bed sores. Visiting doctors and nurses are quite amazed at the good condition of his skin. The monks who are nursing him never eat or drink anything nor sleep in the room. There's very little talking. Usually, you only talk about the next thing you have to do in his care. If you do talk, you talk in a quiet manner, so it's not just a room we nurse him in, it's actually a temple. In 1990, Luang Po suffered from heart failure due to clogged arteries, and once more he survived. But time finally ran out at the beginning of 1992. Luang Po's kidneys started to shut down, and the essential organs depending upon them inevitably followed. Early on the morning of the 16th of January, Luang Po, Prabodhinyana Thera, the monk known throughout the Theravada Buddhist world as Ajahn Chah, passed away. <laughs>